Hello and welcome to episode 94 of Fergo and the Freak. I'm that bloke from Rugby League Project, Andrew Ferguson. You can find me on Twitter at AndrewRLP. And joining me is the glorious League Freak, who you can find on Twitter at League Freak. How are you today, mate? I'm very excited. We've got a really, really special guest, uh, someone that we've talked about having on the podcast basically since the very first day we talked about having a podcast too. So this is going to be a really good episode. Absolutely, because today we have with us absolute royalty when it comes to rugby league history. We have Professor Tony Collins. How are you, mate? Uh, not bad. Uh, and as a convinced Republican, I object to being called royalty. <laughs> 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 I don't even know if anyone in Australia even cares about the royal family anymore. So, <laughs> well, we, you still got the queen's head on the on the on the uh, on, on the money. So, yeah, we we don't even look at it. I mean, yeah. we had people we had people on a TV show here a while back trying to row off parts of it to try and make it look like she was topless or something like that. So that's how much people care about that. <laughs> we do have so we, they'll be in the Tower of London on, our, on one of our notes. So I think it's the fifty dollar note, Miss, Mrs. Doubtfire's on it. If you have a look. Say the okay. twenty. Or the 50. <laughs> we don't even we don't even refer to those cages like lobsters and or pineapples and whatever else. We don't even refer to it as money anymore. Yeah. Um, so today, obviously, we've got the professor on. We're going to talk about um, the history of of rugby league. Essentially, we want to go back as far as we can to find out day one of not just rugby league, but I dare say um, football. I guess. And where it began and how rugby league came to be out of all of that. So how far back can we go? We know that there's a uh, rugby union loves the story about Reverend William Webb Ellis picking up the ball and running with it. I think I was about 1820 sometime. But how much, how long further back before that can we go to start looking at, I suppose, football starting? Well, uh, to the very dawn of civilization, I think, because... It, it seems to be the case that wherever you look, people have always played with a large ball. Uh, and so, you know, you go back, uh, well, obviously Aboriginals and, you know, uh, Aussie rules claim that Aboriginals, uh, Aboriginal ball games were the, uh, um, uh, the originators of Aussie rules, which is complete nonsense. Mm. Um, but it's certainly the case that most civilizations around the world have played some game with a, with a large ball that you can either kick or throw or handle in some way. But um, in terms of what we think of today as the football codes, modern football, it's really a um, it's really a product of the 19th century when the uh, British public schools, which are actually private schools, uh, in a case of classic uh, uh, British doublethink, started to... Um, uh, wanted to educate the the young man who would the young men who would rule Britain and the empire, uh, and they wanted to educate them in a new spirit of competition, of teamwork, uh, of what they call fair play, and so they started codifying their own uh, their own school rules. So all of the top English private schools uh, had and still today have their own type of football. So Eton has one, Harrow has one, um, and obviously rugby itself had one. Um, in terms of William Webb Ellis, um, that is yet another myth. It's interesting that most codes of football have some um, what you might call an origin myth about how they really began, which bear no, re- uh, bear no relation to the truth. And William Webb Ellis is a, another one of those. Um, there's no evidence that William Webb Ellis ever picked up the ball and ran with it. Um, and when there was an inquiry as to est- to establish the truth of that in the 1890s, uh, they couldn't find any evidence, couldn't find anybody who was there at the time, anybody who was uh, uh, who had even heard of it at the time. And it's interesting to note that the um, the commission of inquiry to William Webb Ellis at Rugby School um, de- decided that, well, regardless of the lack of evidence, we're still going to name William Webb Ellis as the founder of the game. And the year in which they made that decision was 1895. Precisely the year that rugby was in a massive crisis about who really owned the game. Was it the yeah. um, the industrial workers in the north of England who wanted to be uh, paid to play, or was it the public schools, largely in the south, but also some of them in the north, who felt that, that rugby was their game? So 
Um, so to William and Valley Smith, he's really uh, it's part of that the, the part of rugby's great split in the 1890s about this kind of culture wars for the Battle of Rugby. So um, so all the football codes, and, and this is one of the really fascinating things. All the modern football codes begin in the 1850s, 60s, and 70s. It's a very short space of time, so you get. Aussie rules derived from rugby school rules because Tom Wills went to rugby school and brought the rules back. The Football Association, soccer, founded in 1863. The Rugby Football Union, 1871. American football, Canadian football, break away from rugby in the 1870s. And then in the early 1880s, you get Gaelic football. And then, in a sense, the culmination of that process is rugby league in 1895. So, in one sense, football, in its widest sense, has probably always been around ever since, um, you know, ever since civilization began. Um, but what we today think of as football is actually very, very modern, and it's less than you know, 150, 160 years old. Now, is there a reason why? it all seemed to happen very close together. Like, obviously, and, and it's funny because you sort of think about that time in, in human history where people were just starting to have enough spare time and to be able to put their physical endeavours into something that was fun rather than having to work or produce food or that sort of thing. Was there was there a catalyst that that forced them sort of changes and forced all of these regional sports to start to codify? Was it something to do with uh, information being transferred easily? Was it something to do with like um, media starting to be produced in newspapers and things like that? What was the catalyst for it? Yeah, precisely. I mean, one of the things you often find when people talk about the history of football of whatever code is that it kind of just happens in a vacuum. Mm. But in reality, it's a... Um, uh, it's part of the development of society, the way that society developed uh, in, uh, particularly in Europe uh, and the English speaking countries into an industrial uh, urban based society. And that so by the early 1800s, the industrial revolution begins, people start to move into cities, the factory system begins. Um, and as the, um, as that grows, there's more demands for leisure time. Uh, so in Britain uh, in 1874, and this is replicated throughout the English speaking world, you get uh, uh, half day holidays on what we call half day holidays on Saturday. People no longer work six days a week, 10 hours a day. They they're knocked off on a Saturday at one o'clock uh, from uh, well, in Britain is 1874. And then the same thing happens in Australia and America and wherever. Uh, and so that's the reason why games, the traditional kickoff games are Saturday afternoon, three o'clock. But you also get at the same time um, the the rise of football through the public school. So football uh, acquires a kind of authority uh, through its use by the the ruling classes around the English around the English speaking world as part of their educational system. And in particular, one of the things that popularises football of all types, but particularly rugby, rugby, is the publication of Tom Brown's School Days in 1857, which is um, a, a massive selling novel. Uh, it was literally the Harry Potter of its day without magic. Uh, and if you read the first Harry Potter book, it's actually very similar to Tom Brown. Mm -hmm. um, and the centrepiece of Tom Brown's School Days was actually um, was actually a rugby match played at rugby, and it's how the, the schoolboys learn their lessons of life and how to become adults and young men and go out and run the empire. And that was a phenomenally successful book. And all around the English speaking world, it became a bestseller. And that was kind of some of the inspiration for countries to take up the rugby code of football. And so you get a, a combination of industrialization, bringing people together, bringing them together in, in cities growth of leisure time, the um, the importance that football is now given to kind of uh, education. And also, as you say, you've got new communication methods. The railways begin in the 1820s and 1830s. So now uh, teams can travel to play each other, which they could never do before. Uh, you have things like telegraph, which allows results to be transmitted, not just in countries, but around the world. And that's obviously very important for communications between Britain and Australia. Um, 
Uh, and you also get newspapers developing. Uh, technology comes into newspapers, and so they're able to print much quickly, uh, much more quickly, um, convey more information. And by the time you get to the end of the 19th century, they're printing photographs and things like that. And so sport becomes a, um, in kind of the same way that today sport relies on um, satellite TV and satellite TV relies on sport. In the 1890s, the newspapers relied on sport in the same way. And football, because it came to represent your kind of local pride, your, your region or your town, um, football acquired much more importance than simply just being a game. And it became it kind of, uh, uh, for these people who were moving into towns, uh, starting new jobs, beginning a, a completely different lifestyle from what their ancestors had led on working on the land. They were now working in the cities. They needed a sense of identity, and that was provided in the football team, either by playing in your local football team or by watching, and it was something that allowed you to bond together. And, you know, as as we know, watching a team, it's much more than simply the technicalities of the sport. You're emotionally involved, and it's it's probably one of the few entertainment, uh, one of the few en- types of entertainment where the people watching – are as emotionally involved as the people who are playing. You, know, you have as big, if not sometimes a bigger stake in the outcome of a match than the people who are actually participating. So football, it's a product of the industrial revolution and it's a product of the way that people's lives change, change at that time. Now with the, uh, as you said, the, the number of codes that sort of start, especially around that 1870s period there, um, how much of that would have also been through to, I dare say, the working class is starting to become unionised, being able to speak up against, you know, the, those people who hire them, being able to air their grievances, and if they weren't happy, they could go in a different direction. Um, you sort of see a bit of linkages in um, when I look into the Australian rugby league history between some of the people involved in the founding of it, and they were involved in uh, unionism and, and stuff like that prior to the birth of the game. Is that a similar thing that happened, I guess, around the 1870s with some of these games and also rugby league in, in England as well at that time? Well, yeah, that's an interesting point because one of the things that happens is that in the um, when the when the games are first codified in the 1860s and 1870s, they're very closely associated with kind of uh, moral education that um, you play football, whatever code you choose, because it helps to um, bring a sense of morality. Uh, so amateurism becomes becomes very important. That you play just for the sake of the game, not to be paid, not to be paid. But as the games become more popular and working class people start to take them up and play and start to watch in tens of thousands, uh, a bit of tension develops because on the one hand you've got working class people who are playing and they they're really good at it. Uh, but they also expect to be paid uh, in all types of working class leisure. If you're the principle broadly is if if you're good enough, you should be paid to do it. You know, from people passing a hat round uh, to have a collection when a, a cricketer takes a hat trick or scores 50 um, to uh, being given some money or a prize for winning a cup competition. There's an expectation of that. But the the leaders of particularly it was also true in soccer but it worked out in a different way but in rugby the leaders of rugby didn't like that because they felt that there was a danger that they would be swamped and that there would be too many working class people playing the game and they would lose control and which kind of reflected what was going on in uh well right across europe and and the english speaking world particularly obviously in england and australia um because there's a general fear in society at that time in the upper and middle classes that perhaps the working classes are getting too powerful. You've got growth of trade unions, then you get the growth of uh, the uh, the Labour Party uh, in, in both countries and socialist yeah. movements. And so the the rise of the working class, in in particularly in rugby, is is seen by the people who run the game as part and parcel of the the general problems that society has at that time. And one of the reasons why I started looking at uh, the history of rugby, I mean, aside from the fact that I'm a rugby league fan, uh, but one of the reasons why it's so interesting from a historical point of view is because 
when people start talking about the uh, the debate on amateurism in rugby that takes place from the 1880s until the split in 1895, really they're talking about class. And people come up with very um, uh, overt statements about, of class prejudice that they wouldn't normally make, that politicians are usually too clever to make. And so you get people in rugby union saying, um, if working class players want to be paid, why don't they go off and play their own game? We don't want them. Or the reason why... Uh, clubs in the north want to change the rules and get rid of lineouts is because their players are too stupid to understand what lineouts are supposed to do. <laughs> and so, yeah, I think you get it's really unvarnished uh, class bigotry coming out in the debate, the debate on rugby, and it's in sport, uh, in most sports to a lesser extent, but in rugby it's really, really pronounced. Um, and one of the reasons why it's so pronounced is because. Soccer allowed professionalism very early on. Uh, there's a debate on professionalism in soccer in 1884 basically and then in 1885 the football association the governing body legalizes soccer uh and that cre- and you know the law of unintended consequences kicks in and immediately from that point no other uh soccer team that is composed of university educated or private school educated players ever again plays in the FA Cup final the FA Cup final is immediately dominated by professional teams from the industrial north and the midlands and the rugby union authorities see see what's happened and say we don't want that to happen we don't want to be sidelined we want to keep control of our game and so they immediately um, turn rugby union into a completely amateur game and uh, anyone who's takes money or is offered a job or is given a gift to play is uh, banned or suspended from playing rugby ever again. And uh, it kind of, so there's a kind of mini civil war going on in rugby over the issue of class. There's other things going on as well. There's a lot about the, the rugby union authorities don't really like commercialism. Um, they're very suspicious of what's going on, uh, of rugby becoming a part of the entertainment industry. They want to keep it morally pure and educational. But by and large, it's a division that rugby's divide is is one of class, and that's exactly the same uh, in Australia as well. So, with if rugby at that time, they knew that there were opportunities that it could become commercial, and obviously there were crowds turning up to see it, but they didn't want players to earn the money. Is there any record of where any money that was made actually was ending up? Yeah, I mean, this is one of the contradictions uh, because they, the the RFU, um, and it was the same with the um, New South Wales Rugby Union as well in, uh, in Australia, um, they made huge amounts of money from international matches, mm-hmm. uh, which um, really that was fed. I mean, th- some of it went to paying the expenses of officials. And that was a bit in the in the split in New South Wales. It was a, the fact that the um, officials would travel first class, um, and the players would travel uh, you know, whatever the equivalent of economy class was, third or second class, uh, was a big issue. Uh, and that was that was also the case the, the case in, in England. Um, but certainly in um, uh, one of the things both that, that happened in both Australia and England was the fact that. The money, the vast amounts of money that was made from internationals went into the building of stadium, which stadium, which was kind of vanity projects. So Twickenham, uh, most most obviously in uh, in Britain. Um, But the players, you know, as you would imagine, thought quite rightly that, you know, it was players that all these people had paid to see. Uh, So why weren't they getting their fair share of it? Um, and the official said, well, no, no, you should remain amateurs, whereas we can have our paid positions within w- within rugby and uh, have more generous expenses and the players are allowed. So, again, you get that sort of uh, class difference breaking out um, just for the, through the day-to-day playing of the game. We did see at some stage, too, in those early days, um, I think I read about it in England, um, where... In order to try and emphasise how important amateurism was, that religion was sometimes tied up in it. And it was that resurfaced again during the whole drama with France during the World War Two as well. They, were, they linked um, professionalism as something that was, you know, 
anti-Catholic, I, I dare say. Um, was that something that was really prominently used as a tool as well in those early early days before rugby league was born? Well, uh, yeah, in one sense, uh, because the the kind of philosophy around the game and the philosophy of Tom Brown's school days and of the English public schools was called muscular Christianity. That it was really about the church. It was a kind of Church of England ideology in a physical form that you had to go out and fight uh, uh, fight for the Christian way of life. And that meant going out into the world and being physical. It wasn't about sitting down and reading the Bible. And so muscular Christianity was very much part of, well, part of all sports that came out of Britain, cricket as well, but particularly in rugby, because obviously it's the most muscular game. Um, and that philosophy, um, again, spread to the rest of the English speaking world. So each country had its own variation of muscular Christianity, uh, included in America, where uh, religion became very important in, in American football. And to some extent, it still is today. Um, in certainly, uh, certainly in the, when the game started to split, one of the things that's quite interesting, I don't think anybody's done any real analysis of this, is that in Australia, as I'm sure you, you guys are aware, it's all rugby league became very closely associated with the Catholic Church. Yes. Uh, and one of the things that uh, um, was always said about the success of rugby league was the fact that Ted Larkin uh, got the game played in Sydney's Catholic schools very early on, and that gave them a tremendous advantage over, over rugby union. In in France, it was slightly different because the, the Catholic Church, as you say, had quite a close association with the leadership of French rugby union and French sport. And so rugby union was always seen as a um, uh, um, as part of that kind of what's called um, profound France, uh, deeper connections uh, with kind of French society. And... Um, so there was a religious element. And the other thing in France was that muscular Christianity, despite the fact that it was popular in, in France. And so, for example, uh, uh, Pierre de Coubertin, the founder of the modern Olympics, was a big uh, supporter of muscular Christianity and was also a big rugby union supporter. He, was, he refereed the first French rugby union championship final. Um, muscular Christianity was very British. And so wherever, you know, it was, part, it was really the ideology of the British Empire. So it didn't really sit very squarely in France either. So that um, uh, that also created problems. We've uh, me and Andrew have talked a lot on personally and on the podcast a little bit about how um, it wasn't one thing that set off the split anywhere that rugby league and rugby union split. It's always been a building pressure that happens. But there always seems to be a, a a candle that lights the flame fully. Was there something that happened in the UK where it really got the ball rolling on there being a split? Um, yeah, as you say, it was kind of a long rolling process and there were lots of different things involved. So I, as I mentioned, obviously, the sort of sense that the working class might take over, the fact that... Um, where rugby had become a mass spectator sport in the north of England and to some extent South Wales. Um, um, it was seen as a um, uh, it was seen as a threat to the values of rugby union. One of the other interesting things that was going on in rugby union as well was the fact that um, there were differences over how to play the game. Mm -hmm. So in the north of England and again South Wales in Australia, New Zealand. They, the conception of rugby there was that it was about running with the ball, scoring tries, passing. It was an open type of game that obviously is at the heart of what rugby league is. And that in Wales, that meant that they invented the 4 3 quarter system so where they really moved rugby from playing with two or three three quarters to widening right across the pitch at four three quarters. Australia and New Zealand never really liked the forward dominated game that was played in. Uh, by the RFU and the RFU in contrast and the kind of uh, and the countries where it was dominated by the public schools, their conception of the game was that it was primarily based around uh, scrums. Goals were more important than scoring tries because that was a more tricky. Tr that was a trickier skill to master. Um, and so the actual way the game was played was part and parcel of the split. And, the, you know, there had been discussions about moving to 13 aside 
get him um, removing two forwards, even before the 1895 split. But in a sense, the catalyst for that split was the proposal from the Northern clubs in England that players should be paid to take uh, for the time they took off work to play the game, what was called broken time. So if you had to break time from work to uh, to play the game, in those days, you, you know, uh, not very not many people got holiday pay, uh, and obviously holiday pay would run out anyway. Um, you had to miss, you had to lose wages to be able to go uh, and play, particularly if you're going to away matches or go playing the internationals. You should be compensated. The RFU said, "Well, no, because you're opening the door to professionalism, and if you can't afford to play, you shouldn't play." And uh, they were very explicit about that, and you know, this idea that if you can't afford it, don't do it became central to their philosophy of the game. And uh, this kind of, it, this debate broke out and went on for, well, from 1886 all the way to 1895. In 1893, the Northern Clubs proposed that rugby should allow payments to players, broken time payments to players. That was voted down by... Uh, um, really, a, a, a type of uh, gerrymandering in the the votes on the RF uh, on the RF at uh, the RFU general meeting, um, and at that point, the RFU started to suspend clubs uh, who had been um, uh, found guilty of allegedly paying their players. So Huddersfield, one of the biggest clubs in the country at the time, were suspended shortly after. Then the following year. Um, Almost all of the leading clubs in Lancashire, your Wiggins, uh, your Salfords, your St. Helens, were all under investigation for allegedly paying the players. And so the game's in chaos uh, because the RFU were determined to impose amateurism. And then they declare in early 1895 that we're going to change the rules at the next annual general meeting in September 1895. We're going to change the rules so that if a club or a player is accused of professionalism, you've got to prove that you're innocent. You'll be oh, suspended wow. until you can prove that this isn't true, which is obviously a reversal of every law of natural justice that you're uh, innocent until proven guilty. And at that point, the Northern clubs thought, we're going to get picked off one by one here. There's, it's end game. And so over that summer, the summer of 1895, they started to organise amongst themselves. And uh, as we all know, tw- on 29th of August, 1895, the... Um, uh, the 20, 22 leading clubs in the north of England formed the Northern Rugby Football Union, which became the Rugby League. Um, and that's kind of similar, although obviously the detail differs, that's kind of similar to what went on in Australia, although the um, the actual mechanisms by which that happened uh, uh, were very different because new clubs were formed, but basically on the same principle that we believe that players who bring the crowds in should be paid. And also we want to play a more open, attractive form of rugby. And because the rules had already been changed in rugby league in 1906, 13 aside and the play of the ball was brought in by the time you get to 1908, uh, when the new South Wales rugby league is formed, they've got the new game and it's, it's very different and much more attractive than rugby union. Now, the one thing that gets, I suppose, lost a bit in this is, um, you know, if you if you do a bit of research, you can find out about the the schism that that saw the the game start in England, and there's a fair few books and stuff out there about the game in Australia, but there's not as much known about the birth of the game in New Zealand, and it, it got to New Zealand the year before, and they had that uh, great tour to to England, um, and they sort of they came back playing this new game and showing the Australians how to play it. And, you know, by then, by the time they returned back to Australia, Australia was already playing rugby league. Um, but New Zealand played a pretty big role in getting the game moving in Australia as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I, you're right. The, the role that the New Zealanders played in establishing rugby league uh, down under was uh, was massive. I mean, they were the cat, they were the, that 1907, uh, what were known as the professional all black toes from uh, Albert Bas- led by Albert Baskerville, was really the catalyst for down under. Um, New Zealand was slightly different because obviously it's a much smaller country, it's not as industrialized as Britain or Australia. Um, 
But on the other hand, New Zealand, like Australia, never really bought completely into the ideas of amateurism. Um, it only, really, as, a, as with Australia, it really only adopted that very stringent form of amateurism because the British told them to. Uh, and also, New Zealand played the game in a, a much more open way. Um, and you can see the way. I think it's interesting where the All Blacks play rugby in today. Um, it's you know it's based on similar principles to to rugby league that you keep the ball um, you keep the ball in the open. You try to avoid set pieces. You know most players can handle fairly decently. Uh, they know how to pass, and the score of tries is at the centre of the way they play. Uh, and that's deep and rooted in New Zealand uh, rugby union. Um, one of the things that's really interesting and kind of contradictory is the fact that one of the reasons why rugby league emerged in uh, New Zealand was because of the success of the 1905 rugby union All Blacks in, in Britain. They towed Britain in 1905-1906, won every single game apart from the Test match with Wales. And uh, not only that, they won almost every game by an incredible margin. They scored... Um, uh, I think it's over 900 points on the course of the tour. Nobody had ever done that. Yes. Um, and they, again, they also, uh, one, of the, one of the most remarkable things, which you rarely see in rugby union history, is that I think it's a case they only kicked three penalty goals, which in <laughs> yeah in rugby union terms, is after, particularly that time, is absolutely mind-boggling because yeah, that's a primary that's way of winning a game. That's 10 minutes of the average rugby union game these days. Yeah, yeah <laughs> like, exactly. Actually, and it shows the dominance of that of that New Zealand side at the time that they just felt we don't need to kick penalty goals. We know we can win yeah. this anyway. Yeah, and they're. Pl- I mean, obviously, they're, um, there's another interesting point about the, why they're able to do that, which I'll, I'll come back to. But they were tremendously successful in terms of crowds and, and generating a huge amount of revenue. They they made a massive, you know, I think, something like nine and a half thousand pounds profit. Ooh. Get back to New Zealand. And a significant proportion of the players are broke yeah. and have to borrow money when they while they're on tour just to live. They get three shillings a day um, uh, expenses payments, which you know it's absolutely ridiculous. They're bringing in thousands of pounds, but they're they're living like paupers. And when they get back, um, there's quite a strong feeling amongst the players that they've been ripped off, and that they're the people who have led to this tremendous profit for the New Zealand Rugby Union. And also they brought this incredible glory back to New Zealand because they all blacks from that point become really part of the New Zealand story. And they're you know, one of the most important uh, symbols of New Zealand national identity. And particularly as it defines itself against Australia, because in 1901, they refused to be part of the Federation of Australia. And so they, you know, this is a, a great um example of why New Zealand's independent because of these wonderful rugby players it can produce. Um, so the players have co- contributed to this. They'd made all this money. They got nothing for it. And whilst they're in England, in England, they're also aware of the fact that in the north of England, players were paid uh, and paid quite well to play high quality rugby. Um, they're also aware of it. I mean, this is the other thing that, uh, again, as we were saying earlier on, because of newspapers and, te- and the Telegraph, uh, and the the speed, relative speed of in those days of um, uh, of, of travel to to Australia, and New Zealand, people were well. If you were a rugby uh, a serious rugby fan, you were well aware of what was going on uh, in England with the Northern Union. There's quite a lot that's written about it in uh, newspapers like the Referee in Sydney. And so in New Zealand, some of the players get together and decide, well, why don't we organise our own tour of uh, of England and uh, uh, and actually try and make some money ourselves. And um, this is obviously going on from for quite some time, and it's probable, I and mean, Sean Fagan's got some good um, uh, detail and speculation about this, it's quite probable that they're in touch with people in Australia, like Victor Trumper, the great Australian uh, uh, batsman and uh, one of the key figures in the formation of Australian rugby league, uh, about forming a, a professional rugby. Um having a professional rugby tour. And then in March 1907, um, uh, Albert Baskerville writes to the rugby, well, the Northern Union, as it then was, uh, here in Leeds, to say, we'd like to organise a tour. Uh, these are our terms. Uh, would you be interested? And you can imagine, this is like a bolt from the blue. And uh, 
you know, rugby league has been struggling slightly in Britain. Uh, um, it's lost uh, Manningham, one of the, the first champions who switched to soccer to become Bradford City. Uh, br- the Bradford club itself is in the process of splitting and one half uh, stays loyal to rugby league. The other half goes off and becomes Bradford Park Avenue Soccer Club. So it's um, it, it's going through some tough times. And so this letter comes from Baskerville and it's like, you know, uh, it's a bolt from the bone. I think this is fantastic because the All Blacks have this big reputation. Um, they're denounced by the New Zealand Embassy. Oh, of yeah. New Zealand agent generals who were then there saying, oh, this is a phantom team. It'll never work. Nobody's interested in playing professional rugby, as it was called. Uh, and so when they finally turned up in uh, at the beginning of September 1907, they're, they're greeted. They turned up in Leeds at the Leeds railway station. They're greeted like conquering heroes. Uh, <laughs> in the meantime, they've stopped off in Australia on the way uh, where they play uh, test matches against a, a, an Australian side. A, a paid Australian side, um, they have to play it under rugby union rules because the Northern uh, Union rule book hasn't turned up yet. Uh, That's right. The, the uh, communication system isn't that good. But that lays the basis. In Australia, it demonstrates that there's a market for a professional rugby. It gives those people involved in the move towards rugby league confidence that this one's going to work. And so that process begins in Australia and you get the... Um, uh, the clubs all meet in the early months of uh, 19, uh, 1908 and form new rugby league clubs. Uh, the New Zealanders play uh, uh, incredibly good players. They're probably, although you can't tell at this distance, they're probably as good as the uh, as the All Black Rugby Union team were that came over. Um, and so they return as conquering heroes. They rugby league doesn't establish itself that quickly in New Zealand once they get back, partly because rugby union is so strong now, uh, partly because the touring players really didn't, they didn't know what they were getting themselves in, into. And so their main focus was on getting the tour organised. Um, again, it, it's to put yourself in their mindset, when they set out from New Zealand, they didn't really know how successful they were going to be. I mean, you know, nobody might have turned out in Sydney to, to watch them. England, you know, uh, it could have been a bust. Uh, the only thing they did know is that they'd be banned for life from ever playing uh, rugby union again. So they were kind of, uh, that was their focus. And it's not until 1910, until a couple of years after they get back, that the New Zealand Rugby League is actually formed. Uh, and then it takes off quite quickly, and Auckland very rapidly becomes a, um, a hotbed of the game. And again, as in Australia and England, it rugby league becomes strong in industrial centres, Auckland, uh, the west coast in the mining areas, and in parts of in parts of Canterbury where there's you know there's there's an urbanised uh, industrial working class. Um, so yeah, um, oh the one of the here's the other point. Uh, stop me if I'm rambling on. One of the really interesting points, the sort of counterfactual what if thing, is that. Um, if there had been no split in English rugby, say they had adopted professionalism, then it's quite probable that um, rugby would not have become uh, the national sport in in either New Zealand, or certainly not had the, the importance, the massive importance that it has in New Zealand or South Africa. But South Africa. Because when the All Blacks visited England in 1905, then the South Africans came over in 1906, um, they were incredibly successful. Hardly, were well, hardly beat. I think they, the, the Springboks were beaten a couple of times when they came over the following year. And they went back as concrete heroes. If they'd have played full strength rugby, you know, if the Northern clubs had still remained in rugby, they'd have played a full strength England team, then they wouldn't have, uh, they'd have played the clubs in the North of England. They wouldn't have won so easily and they wouldn't have gone back as the concrete heroes. And so perhaps. Uh, rugby wouldn't have had that central position in New Zealand and South African society it has today. Uh, so the so the split in English rugby actually helped rugby union in South Africa and New Zealand to become the big sports that they are today. It's interesting because I feel like there's almost a hangover of that these days where, you know, when a team plays the Australian rugby union team, it's really just a bunch of guys from North Sydney private schools that they've beaten, not really the pride of Australia's rugby strength, you know. Um, 
And, and I guess you can say the same thing when Australia plays Great Britain in rugby league. They're not <coughs> taking on the best of the best. You know, it's sort of a, a split playing group. Um, but it's interesting to think about that. Yeah, if, uh, if, if rugby union really would have grabbed the nations of South Africa and New Zealand if they didn't have those all-conquering sides, <laughs> that's a really interesting thing to think about. I, I think that's a, yeah. And I, when you think about it, um, that's the case in most nations that play either league or union. Because, mm. with the exception of um, uh, obviously PNG mm. and Queensland, New South Wales, you haven't got anywhere where rugby league is that dominant. So there's always that issue. But and again, a lot of rugby union people say, oh, it's only played in Eastern Australia and Northern England and uh, mm. PNG. But in fact, you look at rugby union, and uh, aside from New Zealand, where you still got a, rugby, a significant rugby league played, it's also played by a minority of people. Even in mm. Wales, South Wales, uh, soccer is huge there. Cardiff City, Cardiff City, and Swansea City, when they're going well, they get crowds that easily uh, are bigger than uh, the, the local rugby union clubs. In England. Um, it's still largely, rugby union is still largely confined to those who have gone on to either private education or university education. And it's where it's a, a truly cross-class game. That's only in certain centres in the southwest and places like Leicester in the East Midlands. So it's not, a, again, it's not a national, um, it's not a, a national sport in the fullest sense like soccer is. And obviously in South Africa, it's the game of a, very small minority, which happens to be white in a, you know, a, 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 I can't remember what they put, I think 15%, is it? Maybe less than that, the white population of South Africa. So there aren't many countries where rugby union is actually the national game either. That's right. Now, one thing about that 1907-08 uh, New Zealand side is they played a game, I believe, uh, I'm going off a hazy memory on this one. Uh, they played a game in Sri Lanka as part yeah. of their tour. Um, which is basically, I think, just rounding up a few locals and, and playing a game on a local beach or something as I was just stopping over on the journey over. But I don't believe there's been a game played there since. No. Um, oh, it's, it's, it's actually <laughs> one of these interesting sidelines because um, as with most uh, passages to and from Australia, uh, from Britain, um, they stopped off at Colombo in Sri Lanka because uh, it's like two thirds of the way. And Sri Lanka, uh, oddly enough, has quite a strong rugby union tradition because it was played in the elite schools of the British colonial settlers. And then they, as they began to um, uh, open schools for the uh, Sri Lankan elite, it's also played then. So it's still, it's rugby union, still a very important game in Sri Lankan private schools. Um, but the, but the, um, so the Kiwis stopped off as all rugby teams did in Colombo and they played against a team, the colonial team, it's an all white team that they played against. And somebody raised the objection in the, whatever the Colombo newspaper was to say, well, hang on a minute, aren't these professionals? And the, the um, Colombo rugby union said, well, they haven't actually played a professional game yet, so we can still play them, but we won't be able to play them on the way back because they'll have played yeah. against the <laughs> against the professionals, and that means you know obviously we can't touch them; they're um, it, uh, they'll contaminate us, uh, which wasn't true because they played a professional game against uh, against the Aussies uh, on the uh, on the way uh, when they stopped off in Sydney on the way uh, on the first leg of the journey. That's right. Um, uh, so so that yeah, so they played a game of rugby union. That was the last, as far as I'm aware, that's the last game of. Uh, um, professional uh, rugby or a game associated with rugby league that was uh, um, that was played. I don't think there's ever been a rugby league game uh, in Sri Lanka. But again, in a sense, it shows the hypocrisy that they were prepared to turn a blind eye because they wanted to get they, this game was quite important to them to the local community uh, of expats there. They they were prepared to turn a blind eye to the fact they were you know they. But certainly by the standards of rugby union, they were professionals who they were playing against. And there's a lot of uh, that hypocrisy through rugby union. I mean, we've we've joked, and it's been joked for a long time, how um, when rugby union finally turned professional in 1995, that they just really decided to start uh, paying taxes on what they were earning. Yeah. Um, it, 
one thing I would like to ask you is with the formation of rugby league in um, Great Britain in a, in particular, are there things that when you look back at them, are there mistakes you felt like they made or are there things that you think they should have done differently that maybe would have given rugby league a better foothold in the UK than what it had? Because obviously it was mostly confined to, to the North and it really still is for the most part. Are there any mistakes you think were, were glaring mistakes that they made? Um, yeah, a lot. I mean, I think... Um... It, obviously, it's, it's always it, it's always easy to criticise people in the past because you've got the benefit of hindsight. So oh, you should have mm-hmm. this, you should have that. Um, but one of the things that's interesting is that they were criticised. Um, there was a, um, a quite popular weekly socialist paper in the 1890s called The Clarion that was published in Salford. And their, um, their rugby correspondent was a guy called A.A. Sutherland, who was um, uh, connected with the Salford Club. And he attacked the rugby clubs in the north of England before the split for not declaring for open professionalism. And he argued that if they'd have gone professional earlier, that would have stopped the growth of soccer because soccer starts to explode really from the early 1890s. Just at the point rugby civil war is at its deepest and the northern clubs are saying, we want broken time and, uh, you know, it's not really professionalism and they kind of wanted to try and find a compromise or a modus vivendi with the, the amateur uh, zealots in, in the rugby union. Uh, Sutherland said, well, no, because they're not going to compromise. And they've said this, that, you know, they're prepared to um, to see a split in the game. And all that does is that it means that soccer gets more popular. And in Manchester, which was a uh, originally up until the mid 1880s, a hotbed of rugby, Manchester had been taken over by soccer because they had the FA Cup, uh, which is incredibly popular. Rugby had no national cup competition because the, the rugby union didn't like cup competitions. Soccer had the football league and also, you know, uh, lots of local leagues. Um, the RFU, again, opposed leagues. And it was only leagues were only formed in Lancashire and Yorkshire in 1892, 1893. Um, and so Sutherland said, look, you strike while the um, if we declare for, for professionalism, have a league system, uh, things are, you know, we'll have a chance of fighting off the threat of soccer. So I think you could say they left it too late. Um, they really waited for the um, uh, until the very last minute until they realised they were going to get picked off one by one. And even after the split, a lot of people thought in the Northern Union thought, well, maybe there's a chance of compromise that we'll become like the professional league. Uh, in the rugby union, just like the football league is the professional league in the football association, um, which is kind of naive because the people who ran the rugby union were absolutely determined not to have any compromise. And you could tell that the, the way that after the split, uh, anybody who was associated with the rugby league in any way whatsoever was expelled from rugby. Uh, most you know, people who had played uh on the same team as someone who had played rugby league were expelled from rugby union. Oh, yeah. um, the, the most bizarre case is that there was a, uh, a Christmas pantomime uh, troupe that had put on uh, some kind of you know, typical British pantomime in local theatres in Yorkshire, uh, organised charity rugby matches to raise money for local charities, hospitals and things like that. And the rugby union, the Yorkshire rugby union banned their team some played in these charity matches because the the pantomime troupe had also played charity matches against uh, Northern Union sides. Oh. So it was kind of insane what was going on. And they were just absolutely uh, frenzied in, the, in their attempts to get rid of uh, any association with rugby league. So I think you could have probably said in uh, with hindsight, and as Sutherland said at the time, if they'd have said, right, we're going to look, these are, these are our demands. We want broken time. We want a league system. And if we don't get it, we're going to form our own uh, association or union. Then they, they, they probably wouldn't have got it because the RFU were determined not to compromise. But it would have made the split a lot cleaner and a lot clearer what was going on. As it turned out, the 22 clubs broke away. And then eventually over the course of the next five or six years, most of the clubs in the north eventually joined them. But it took a long time and it was kind of messy and unclear. Uh, so, so yeah, I think they could have done that. Um, they probably could have changed the rules earlier. 
uh, it wasn't until 1906 that definitively the game definitively moved away from rugby union when it went to 13 a side and the play the ball was introduced instead of rucking and mauling for it. Um, they'd they'd had exper- 13 a side had been discussed before the split and what as part of the the differences in conceptions of how rugby should be played. And um, immediately after the split, I think in December 1895, they'd played a couple of experimental 13 side games, but they um, they decided not to follow up on it. And so they kind of um, didn't change the game as quickly as what it might have done to make it more attractive, uh, not least to counter the threat of soccer, because one of the things that happened in the early 1900s was that in the traditional rugby playing areas of, of Yorkshire, where there had been no professional soccer whatsoever, uh, apart from Sheffield in the south of Yorkshire and Middlesbrough in the north, it had been entirely rugby dominated. Um, but by the time you get to the early 1900s, you start to see soccer clubs being formed. I was at Bradford City in 1903, because Manningham decides that he wants to play soccer rather than rugby. Um, Leeds United, 1904 or 5, Hull City, 1905, uh, Huddersfield Town, 1910. Uh, 1910. And so the, the slowness of changing the game and the kind of um, uh, the, 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 in a sense, the disbelief that the rugby union wouldn't compromise at some point gave the advantage to soccer. Uh, in the north of England, uh, and it delayed the impact that um, the, the change in the rules in 1906 really had because it opened the game up, made it far more attractive. It really put try scoring, passing, running with the ball, the, you know, the essence of rugby and the essence of rugby league um, at the forefront of the game for the first time. Uh, which is one of the things why it's so attractive to uh, the New Zealanders and the Aussies at the time. So, so yeah, I mean, the big question in hindsight, is what would have happened if the RFU had have said in 1881, OK, we'll allow professionalism, it'll be tightly controlled, and maybe each team can only have two or three professionals, and then it tried some way, try, probably tried some way of compromise over it. If they'd have adopted professionalism before soccer, then who knows? Uh, you know, rugby, rugby would have possibly become the world game, and uh, soccer would have been a minority game and the rule, because rugby would have commercialised much quicker, the rules would have been changed and rugby league would have been the global sport. Um, and at this point, anyone who's a rugby union fan listening to this will think this is typical league insanity. Um, and perhaps there is an element of wishful thinking, but who knows what would have happened if those decisions had have been taken differently at that time. It's interesting you said that because... I remember um, a lot of officials that were involved with the Glebe Rugby Union team, and they were quite successful in the early 1900s here in Australia. Um, They were sort of pushing in the early 1900s before rugby league began that some level of professionalism needs to creep into the game. Not, Not crazy, as you said, but maybe just enough for broken time payments or just in the cases of players who got injured or couldn't work would get recompensed. Then that would be a step in the right direction for rugby union when it was in the midst of a lot of talk going on about professionalism and a professional co thinking about breaking away. These people at Glebe thought that that would be a way to quell that, fix everything, and make the game better and make it move forward and make Australia a better rugby nation. And the officials, as you said before, just like they were in, in England, steadfastly refused to change their stance. And Glebe decided, well, that's it. We're just going to switch codes. And given they were the top side, they just dragged a few other teams with them at the same time who believed in the same thing. And it was all, as you said, working class teams from working class areas. And I look at it and wonder, how much did the officials in Australia, if possible, learn from what England had gone through when they, when they had their great split? Um, given that the the English one was a bit slower, I guess. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think one of the interesting things that comes out in this is, was that, uh, in a sense, what was going on in rugby league was actually the same process that was going on in everywhere else where rugby was played and was a mass spectator sport where it appealed to, to all classes. 
And so you had the same sense that rugby should be a spectacle. It should be an open game. South Wales, North of England, uh, Australia, New Zealand, and also France later on. And they also had a much more relaxed attitude towards payments to play. The, you know, well, why can't we have broken time? It's not really professionalism. And it, as you say, it helped solve the problems. And this was, you know, they in the north of England, the clubs thought that broken time was a way of compromising with the RFU's amateurs. It was like a halfway house between professionalism and amateurism. But the RFU refused to allow it. And and so it's really the uh, it's really the English RFU who stopped the natural development of rugby into a more open game, a game where professionalism of various kinds is allowed, which is what happened with soccer. Soccer developed because they had allowed professionalism, early, professionalism earlier on. It went through this development process where the game was made more attractive. Uh, leagues were introduced. Um, players were paid. So you didn't necessarily, you know, at various levels. So you didn't have to be a full-time professional. You could just get, you know, a couple of quid for playing in a match for your local team. That process was stopped in rugby around the world because the the RFU didn't want it to happen. And because rugby was seen as a very British game, the most British of games, the RFU had tremendous authority and people just fell into line with it. And it's only really when those tensions become unbearable in the north of England and in Australia and New Zealand that it breaks apart. Um, In South Wales, where, again, open game, they pay players indirectly through what's called boot money, where allegedly you have pound notes put into your boots after a match. Um, they are a few compromised and decided they weren't going to expel the Welsh because that would have been too big a blow to international rugby, but they just turned a blind eye to it. Um, so it's that the weight of authority that the RFU has and also the deference towards the RFU that the other rugby union South, which is part of that sort of British Empire mentality at the time, meant that the natural development of rugby is not allowed to work through. And so you so and it results in splits in three of the most important rugby countries. But you know, that natural development is stopped. So again, you could say, well, that's just that's just hindsight. But the RFU were very conscious of it, because one of the one of the interesting things is that after World War One, the Australian and New Zealand rugby union said, "Look, we've got to, we need to make the game more attractive because it's losing out to it's losing out to league. Soccer keeps rising as a threat and then disappearing. Um, we want to make the game more attractive. We want to move away from all this scrummaging. We don't like it. Our players don't like it. And we also think we should be a bit more relaxed about players being given money to go on tour or go to away matches." And the RFU respond by saying. We're completely opposed to this. And if you insist on doing this, we'll have no other option but to expel you because we see uh, we want to honour the sacrifice that all those players, rugby players killed in World War One made. And if you change the rules of the game in this way, you're spitting on that heritage. And they literally said this. They said that they used the the fact that uh, you know a number of significant number of uh, rugby union players have been killed in in World War One as a rugby league players uh, as a kind of uh, hammer to be the heads of anyone who dared suggest they they should reform the game and they managed to keep control over rugby union for the next fifty odd years really. It's interesting that uh, they had that that attitude towards things. And then you fast forward to 1995 when the Super League war was on in Australia. And that was, that was almost going to spill over into rugby union. And it was at that point, they said they really basically saw the writing on the wall and it was either look, yeah, you go professional here or you could, you, you could lose it all because rugby league and, and uh, the, the wars that are fighting over in the media down in Australia are basically starting to throw all the money around and they're trying to grab everything and they'll grab it if you want to or not. So it's kind of interesting to know that it's happened a few times in rugby union and that in rugby union's history, you can't tell it without rugby league. Absolutely. I mean, the two are in, I mean, they're different games, very different cultures, um, but the, the two are joined at the hip. Mm. Um, and again, this is hindsight and it's sort of kind of speculative history, but um, I do think one of the mistakes that were made from a rugby league perspective, one of the big mistakes that was made 
by the people negotiating with News Corp and also uh, with Packer as well, is that they basically had a hands-off attitude towards rugby union. Um, if there had been someone, and I'm going to have to be diplomatic about how I put this, if there had been someone with a more aggressive frame of mind towards rugby union and who saw a, a bigger long-term picture, then you would have thought that person might have gone to Murdoch and said, look, we want an exclusive deal because we want to go and sign up a lot of these all-black players. You know, people mm-hmm. like Jonah Lomo uh, started off as a league player anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, wouldn't it be great to have a second New Zealand team in the comp made up of um, New Zealand All Blacks? Uh, maybe we can get some of the South Africans, get a lot of these French guys who, you know, again, a lot of them, uh, Philippe Salah, the great French centre, who's, I think he played in the 95 World Cup, grew up as a rugby league player. Let's get these guys back in the game and have another pro team in France, maybe two. Um, but, you know, the, the the leadership of rugby league has traditionally been very limited in its vision, always had blinkers on, very parochial. Uh, so I think possibly the the um the game lost an opportunity there as well to actually expand its footprint and you know establish itself as uh, uh at least on an equal footing if not more powerful than than the union at that point i think it's uh, another interesting aspect about that which shows i suppose rugby league's um inability to to act quickly at times was that it took england the yeah you know, near on 30 years to decide to stop calling themselves union and call themselves rugby league in, in 1922. Was was there a reason related to rugby union as to why they decided to change then? Because, I mean, Australia had been calling it rugby league since since they were born in 1908. Uh, no, it was because of the Aussies. The Aussies said, why don't you, why don't you change again? Change the name of the game. Because uh, <laughs> it's ridiculous to call themselves the Northern <laughs> Union. Because, uh, as you say, it had always been known as rugby league in Australia. And... In Britain, because the main competition uh, was called the Northern Rugby League, the game, just through you know, in informal speech in the newspapers, became known as the Rugby League because there were no leagues in union at that point anyway. Um, and so they had this anomaly where everybody was calling it uh, Rugby League, but they were still in, still the Northern Union. And I, I think the Aussies had actually raised it with them before the First World War. Um, and I think in... Um, one of the things that happened in British Rugby League was that in, uh, I think it was 1920, um, John Wilson took over as secretary of the game. Wilson, um, who was actually Scottish and had been a um, had been a cyclist at the 1912 Olympics, had a, uh, a much broader outlook on the game and world sport than your traditional uh, northern born and raised administrator. And um, so I think he probably uh, would have understood that it's important to differentiate from union. And also he was uh, he was instrumental in taking the game to France because he had lots of connections with cycling in France and professional cycling in France that helped establish the game uh, in the, there in the 1930s. So um, uh, the rugby league in Britain was was lucky at that point that it had someone who's a bit more far sighted than. Uh, the, the administrators that generally it's had bef- uh, before and since. So, so yeah, but it's we've got to thank the Aussies for the name of the game. You're you're welcome, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> thank you um, very much. <laughs> um, one of the things you don't hear much about is how the game in France was born, because the, I've always said that the French. When it comes to rugby league, they just naturally, they've got that thing of they want to play it in an expansive, beautiful style of a game as well. And we obviously know the stories about, you know, Vichy France and what happened there. But how did rugby league get to France? How did that process begin? Well, a good question. And again, it's because France, the um, rugby was taken to France by... Um, if you like the uh, Anglophile elite, the the people in the elite French society who look towards Britain and particularly the British Empire 
as an example to be emulated. Uh, in 1871, France had been defeated by Prussia in the Franco-Prussian War, and that created a massive, uh, uh, a massive crisis in French society. And they said, "Well, how can we re- gain back our, you know, uh, our, our national pride?" And a lot of people said, "Well, let's take a leaf out of Britain's book. Sport seems to be uh, have been the most imp- one of the most important components of the British Empire. We should start playing British sports, by which they really meant." Uh, uh, they didn't mean cricket, which was seen as too English, uh, but particularly rugby, which is the dominant code of football in Britain in the 1870s. So, as I mentioned before, Pierre de Coubertin, the founder of the Olympics, was a big fan, uh, went to rugby school, uh, became the um, the first referee uh, in a French championship game. And it spread very, very rapidly in the south and west of France. And it essentially became a, a mass spectator sport by, by 1900. Thousands of people went to games. It was played by all classes. You had elite clubs in France, uh, like Racing Club, um, Bordeaux as well. There was uh, elite uh, clubs there. But they, just as in England, they started to become overshadowed by more working class teams in the south and particularly uh, in uh, around, the, around the Pyrenees, uh, over from sorry, Biarritz in the on the west coast, all the way across uh, through what we see as rugby league land today, like Perpignan, uh, all the way to Marseille and uh, Toulon. Um, that created tremendous uh, pressures, just as it had done in England and Australia. Um, in France, there was even less time for amateurism. Um, um, I think it's... Uh, this, this, the, the French novelist Stendhal, although he wasn't, this was written before rugby, once said that uh, uh, amateur means dunce. And so the French had a bit of contempt for the idea of amateurism. <laughs> um, and so payments to players and um, what was called, um, uh, so uh, I think it's called social assistance, roughly translated, whereby local businessmen would give uh, jobs, houses and things like that to players became very popular and so you get a situation where rugby in the south of france by 1910 1911 1912 is basically the same as rugby in england or australia before the split so much so in fact that in 1912 the, the, in, in the rugby league archives there's a letter from a french guy in 1912 saying you should come and play matches here because basically the French are playing the game the same way as it's played in the north of England, wow. both in playing style and the fact that they're, they're, um, um, they're pain players under the counter, but nevertheless they're pain players. And the, the rugby union's kind of aware, the rugby union in England is kind of aware of this and they don't like it. However, so when the kangaroos come over in 1920-21, they try and organise a match in Paris. And the French Rugby Union uh, contacts the authorities and basically stops them from hiring any stadia in Paris. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, and so that kind of puts the lid on things for a while. But in the 1920s, rugby becomes even more popular in France, becomes absolutely massive. Um, you get um, uh, you get examples of. Uh, Clubs buying team, effectively buying a team of players to win the championship. Uh, and so the tensions become more and more unbearable uh, between amateurism and kind of covert professionalism. And then in 1931, the French are expelled from Rugby Union's Five Nations, ostensibly because there's, um, there's an outbreak of fighting when they play um Wales in the 1931 Five Nations Championship. But there's kind of, it's, for a long time, there's been a lot of disquiet amongst the English about the levels of payments for play in France. And also, they don't really like playing against people who don't speak English. Um, you know, they see this as a, a game for people of the British Empire, and the French are only tolerated. Uh, um, so, for example, it's not until 1979 that the French actually become full members of Rugby Union's international board, despite the fact they've been playing um, Five Nations Rugby Union for 70 years. So mm-hmm. that kind of attitude prevails. So they kicked out and they lose one of the most important um, attractive features of rugby for France, which is that they can play England every year. Um, 
And so you've got a combination of circumstances. They're kicked out of rugby union, of international rugby union. The players in demanding payments. Uh, the big crowds are bringing loads and loads of money in. And again, you get the same movement as you get in New Zealand. Players start to think, well, how come we're not getting our full reward for being the the you know the the people who bring all these crowds and give the game such national prominence? And thanks to John Wilson, as I mentioned before, has contacts in the French cycling industry. It's, cycling is the most professional sport in France at that time. It's the pioneer of commercial sport. The Tour de France began in 19, uh, 1903. And it's basically the most significant sport in France. People involved in that uh, are also interested in professional sport. And they, you know, so they promote boxing. Uh, they try to do American football as well later in the 1930s. Uh, Wilson meets with them. They obviously come to some agreement uh, about promoting the game in France. And then Jean Gallier, who's like the number one rugby union forward in France, uh, played for the national team, clearly one of their greatest ever players, um, decides, becomes the figurehead of this, kind of like Baskerville in New Zealand. And he signs an agreement with the Rugby League that he will bring a Rugby League touring team to Britain in 1934. The uh, the touring kangaroos, the 33-34 um, kangaroos, uh, play a, an exhibition match against a, a British side, in Paris on New Year's Day 1934 and French rugby league explodes. Within six years, they've almost got as many clubs as rugby union. Everybody thinks this is the most French version of the game. Everybody expects rugby league to overtake rugby union very quickly. In desperation, the English rugby union authorities allow France back into the five nations to try and stop the, the growth of rugby league. And then... 1st of September, 3rd of September, sorry, 1939, World War II breaks out and everything is frozen. The rugby union authorities are part and parcel of the, the culture and politics of Vichy France, which is the collaborationist government uh, of France during the war, and they ban rugby league. And the game never fully recovers from that blow. So, um, which kind of shows that, again, it illustrates the point that wherever rugby becomes a mass spectator sport, it's kind of headed in the rugby league direction. Mm. And it's only the um, the absolutely virulent and deep-seated hatred of the league and what it represents that stops it developing in France, and even to the extent of, you know, the, the, the people who ban it, the rugby union people who ban it, are collaborators with the Nazi uh, invaders. The, uh, the game in France did... Um... It did recover after the after the war briefly, and I think it was largely because uh, a lot of the players who came through in the the, the uh, late forties and fifties and to a part the early sixties had lived through a lot of that drama that went on with the game being deleted, you know, as as children and teenagers and the like. But once that generation stopped playing football, that golden period of rugby league that was in France sort of seemingly came to a, a very abrupt halt, and it's never really recovered. Um, it's also worth noting too that the the French governments I don't think have ever um, have they ever have they actually apologised for that or have... no there was a government no. inquiry um, into it in I think the early two thousands but it, I don't think the report was ever published um, you're right I mean there was that gold the the the, the, the second golden era of French rugby league was obviously the early nineteen fifties when uh, Pri Bear side came to France and just dazzled everybody with a fantastic football there um, uh, and then it came back again in 50, 55 um, they should have won the World Cup in 54 when it first stayed yes. in Paris but were uh, uh, it sounds like they were just um, they were taken by surprise by a, a, an underdogging uh, Great Britain team but there are also structural problems because when the game was started uh, after the end of World War Two. Um, the uh, all sports in France and still today have to be registered with the government when the French Rugby League went to uh, register with the government in uh, late 1944, early 1945 the person they were negotiating with was actually, who was the head of the government sport agency, was a rugby union official <laughs> they weren't allowed to call their game rugby, it was Joatres, the game of 13 they could have no more than 200 professionals, the game wasn't allowed to be played in schools 
So there was all these structural disadvantages. And then in the late 1950s, early 1960s, um, Charles de Gaulle comes to power. His main thing is um, building up French national prestige. Rugby union is very important to the government. Uh, one of its ministers, uh, Jacques Chaban Delma, actually played for the French rugby union team in the 40s. Uh, although he was, um, according to Robert Fasolet, the great historian of French rugby, he was always very sympathetic to rugby league. But the but rugby union, for obvious reasons, played a much more important role for the diplomacy of French, of the French government than what rugby league could ever do. Because obviously you go to a match at Twickenham, and there in the crowd are you know government ministers, senior civil servants, bankers, uh, judges, the rest of it. You go to a rugby league international in the north of England, and they're not there because. It has a completely different constituency. Mm. So rugby union helped fulfil the political aims of the de Gaulle regime. So rugby league's completely on the back foot. And then in the 1960s, French rugby union becomes very rich and it starts uh, picking off rugby league players. So one of the great French players, uh, great rugby union French players, World Rugby Union Hall of Fame member Joe Masso, um, started off as a rugby league player. His father was a French international and... um, uh, he just simply couldn't resist the amount of money that was offered to him by French rugby union in the 1960s. And according to Robert Fasolet, um, he's spoken to Masso about this and he said, well, I just couldn't take the amount of money they offered. I couldn't turn it down. And when I signed the contract to play French rugby union, um, I cried because I was given up my birthright. Mm. Um, so, you know, so the game, um, and it had its own problems as with rugby league in every country, the, um, the, the officials in the game tend to be very parochial, uh, didn't have much vision for the game, uh, had their own club's interests at heart rather than the bigger interests of the game. So you had all the usual problems that rugby league has and an aggressive rugby union, a government that didn't really like it. And, you know, that in fact, the rules of sport were, were uh, organised, raged against it as well. So... It's done remarkably well to survive to the extent where, you know, the Castle and Dragons are, uh, um, uh, have really revived the fortunes of French rugby league for the first time in, you know, uh, 50 years, really. Um, one of the the things that you see with rugby, rugby league around the world is there's very different attitudes to the different countries that play. And I always get the feeling that in Australia – Australian Rugby League's attitude has always been, why not? Whereas in Great Britain, I always, whenever I've talked to British fans, and I used to do it a lot, uh, more uh, like about 10 years ago, I don't do it as much anymore, but there's always seems to be this defeatist attitude of, we don't do certain things because we know they'll fail. And I always used to talk about why the game wasn't expanded more in England. And I'd get things like, well, Rugby Union's going to stop us and the grounds aren't there and stuff like that. We don't tend to have those attitudes in different parts of the the world where rugby league is played. Um, do, is there a reason that you think that that sort of attitude is still in the British game? Because even now, like you talk to a lot of people now that are, you know, are in the British game and they're very pessimistic about th- that they can sell the game to other British people. And yet they'll say it's the be- best game in the world. Do you get that feeling or is that just something that maybe as an outsider we get more? No, you're absolutely right. Um, There's a kind of, uh, um, I I think you're right, it it is a type of defeatism. Mm. Partly this is because obviously rugby league in this country has struggled uh, in very difficult circumstances against rugby union. Rugby union is really the establishment game and it kept out the armed forces, kept league out the armed forces kept out universities, still keeps out a certain type of private uh, and grammar schools here. Um, There's a lot of inbuilt prejudice. I mean, if you go outside of a rugby league area, so so for example, I worked for a long time in Leicester, people, and rugby union and soccer are the two dominant games in Leicester, people there either don't know very much about rugby league or they assume it's an inferior version of, of rugby union. Uh, And so there's a lot of inbuilt prejudice. I mean, Britain is an incredibly... Um, class-bound system, not just in terms of social structure, which you know, every society is, but in terms of attitudes. 
And so rugby league is associated. Uh, and I've talked to people at the BBC, just general sports journalists at BBC, and they have a similar type of attitude that rugby league is a small sport based in the north of England. Um, and it's treated as a kind of regional oddity, like, you know, caber tossing in Scotland or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's a real problem for the game. Um, and that's difficult to, um, it's difficult to deal with, but it's not impossible. Mm-hmm. I think the other pro- one of the other problems is that, you know, in British class society, hierarchy, although people don't view it necessarily as it's hierarchy is very important and forms of deference to those above you are very important. And for a long time, when, particularly when rugby union was amateur, uh, rugby league could go on about could go about its own business and not really become too concerned about rugby union. And maybe it signed some players from Wales, and uh, you know the fact that that's dried up by and large is an issue. But by and large, the two the two games would never really have much communication until somebody tried to from from union tried to play a league. And I think that was partly due to the the leadership of the rugby league felt that well, let's just stay in our own place. If we stay in our box. They won't disturb us, and so we better not disturb them. And that's, and you often find that when there are discussions about rugby league clubs being formed in other parts of the country, certainly up until the 1970s, the rugby league attitude would be, well, we're not trying to poach rugby union clubs or rugby union players. If people want to play the game, then that's up to them, but we're not going to do anything to encourage them to leave rugby union or to poach clubs from rugby union, which is not, you know, it, it's, uh, you may say that. Uh, as a diplomatic front, but you know, uh, they're again, going for the so, same heads. They're going for the same sort of yeah, sporting yeah, attitudes in the people that want to pick up a ball and have a bunch of people try and tackle them. And yeah, and also the other thing that's interesting is that the Rugby Football League never did, never took any steps to counter the discrimination against rugby league players. Uh, so the the ban on rugby. Uh, union players playing league or league players going to play union. Uh, the rugby league never did anything about it. It was only uh, the British amateur rugby league, and particularly Maurice Allroyd, one of the great uh, great names in British rugby league administration, who actually took the fight to the RFU and went to the government and said, "Look, this isn't fair. We we've got players who play for um, uh, rugby union teams on a Saturday. They want to play amateur rugby league teams on a Sunday, but union bans them." Um, so, so the, the rugby league like to stay, you know, like to maintain that distance from union, not appear to be a threat to union, and that's that's very deeply rooted. And I think you get that in some rugby league supporters who say, um, uh, you know, let's just stay, you know, we don't want to expand, but let's stay, let's stay in the north, in the heartlands, uh, and that the idea is that we should have a club in London or a club, you know, God forbid, in Toronto, uh, are really we're kind of we we're going too far. We're going to suffer for this. And it's kind of a reflection of that attitude, uh, which in Britain you get a lot. Um, uh, working class families often tell their kids not to become too big for their own boots or they're too clever for their own good. Uh, and I was told this, by the way. Um, <laughs> and really, that's what, what that says. It should stay in your place. Know your place. And that's deeply rooted, not just in rugby league, but throughout working class culture in Britain. Uh, so there is that. So I think I think that's a that's a that is a big issue. And people use rugby union's discrimination as an excuse not to do anything. And the reality is that it's you know if that attitude have, would have prevailed in the 1890s, we would have never had rugby league because mm. people would have said oh, it's too big a risk to break away. The rugby union will just attack us. We won't be able to sign any players. We'll never make money. Soccer's bigger than we are. There's always these reasons why it shouldn't have happened, but uh, partially because their backs were to the wall. They were forced against the wall by the rugby union. The leaders, the leaders of the Northern Club said, no, we've got to draw the line here. We've got to stand up and do our own thing. Um, so, yeah, I think you're right. I think that is part of the attitude. And in countries where they're either not so deferential or the game is a, a, a dominant game, uh, then there's a much there's a much better uh, much better attitude, a much better sense of what can be achieved by the game. So, yeah, I think you're right. There's this contradiction between believing we're the greatest game and then thinking, oh, the game's dying. Uh, you know, we're going to run out of money. Things have never been so bad. Um, and it's just not true. People have been predicting the death of rugby league ever since the the 30th of August, 1895, literally. Yes, yeah, yes I, I have. Said, yeah. The response of the press when the Northern Union was formed was, on in, in many places, so... It's um, it won't last. 
they'll they'll either collapse or they'll go back to rugby union and 100 and, what 100 and, uh what we 124 years later uh we're still here there's never been more countries play the game and even in britain where there's a, there's a bit of a sense of pessimism at the moment the game's never been more played uh, on a wider geographical basis so so yeah it's it's a psychological thing and there's a you know lack of belief in the game that um shouldn't really be there well it's been absolutely fascinating having you on now one thing we will say before we uh before we let you go is you do have your own podcast rugby reloaded yeah um 10 minutes uh uh steps back into the history of uh well rugby league in particular obviously but also rugby union uh soccer Aussie rules Gaelic football uh, i try and cover the history of most of the football codes and so, and also we do interviews as well. So obviously Andrew's been on, um, and I, I have to say, because obviously um, taking my academic historian hat off, I'm obviously I'm a rugby league fan, uh, uh, but there's a lot, there's quite a lot of rugby union coverage on on rugby reloaded, but a lot of it is very interesting from a rugby league perspective. So just because it's union doesn't mean to say it's not interested uh, if you're a leaguey or or tied in for that matter, to, to rugby yeah. league. Um, yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah. And obviously you've got some some phenomenal books. I've got two of them, but the, the one I really want to get is the uh, the hardest one to find, which is about the the split. You, you see it on, I don't know if you've ever had a, done a Google search a Google search for it, but you have to find it up on Amazon and stuff like that. It's got like price tags like $9,000 and 5000 bucks. Uh, <laughs> yeah, listen, I've got to apologise apologize for that because working in university, there's a certain... Uh, you're expected to publish in uh, with uh, university publishing companies. Like I won't name the names because I don't want to get sued. But and they te- they charge a ridiculous amount of money. But um, uh, for, for books, so I'm I'm kind of um, embarrassed by that, and I wish it didn't happen. But I am actually work. It's the 125th anniversary of the founding of the game in Britain next year. So I'm working on a, a history which brings together a lot of stuff I've done before and brings in some new stuff. Um, called Rugby League, A People's History, which will be out uh, at some point during the 125th anniversary. I'm not quite sure yet. So stay tuned. Um, and hopefully a lot of the, well, certainly a lot of the stuff that we've discussed uh, today is going to be in that, uh, in a bit more depth and a bit more, uh, and a bit less umming and ah That would be absolutely fascinating. Um, I'll be making sure I get a copy of that because as a historian myself, I absolutely love those history books and, the the one you've got on the uh, the social the social game I think it was called um, yeah the rugby league in twentieth century rugby yeah twentieth century social and cultural history yeah absolutely fascinating that and that that's why I mean obviously you, I asked a few questions about about the religion side of things and the working class of it I I find it all absolutely fascinating that it's there's you know when you stumble into rugby league history as I did it's uh, you, you quickly learn there's a lot more at play than just players wanting to be paid. There's such a big picture to it all. And um, I think we've been able to touch on quite a fair bit of it today about, uh, you know, how, how big that story actually is. Yeah, you're right. It's, it's, it's social history as well. It's, it's about much, much more than 13 players throwing a ball around on a field. It really gets to what makes society tick and how societies operate and the role that sport plays in those societies and and league and in a kind of different way union uh far and away the most interesting sports to look at because they are they they reflect everything that's going on in society at particular times absolutely um just before we go i wanted just to say more than about i think it was probably about 17 years ago or something like that i actually got in touch with you tony and yeah i remember yeah yeah, yeah, we took, got some information about the Rugby League World Cup trophy when it was it was uh, misplaced, let's say. And I I always remember you were so so forthcoming with information. You didn't ask for anything in return. And whenever your name has been brought up, I always tell people about it because there are a lot of people in rugby league that they sort of when you ask them for a little bit of information or something, they sort of guard it very closely. And you, you were the complete opposite and you helped me. Sean Fagan was another one that helped me with, with uh, some history things I was working on. And this is a long, long time ago now. So I just wanted to thank you from back then and thank you for continuing to be you today. And, you know, you're one of the games, you're a real treasure to the game because 
you really, you know, you're putting the game's history back in the spotlight. You're really bringing it all together. And, you know, having you on here today has just been absolutely brilliant. So thank you once again. Right, you're making me blush, mate. But, I, so, yeah, I think this is important. And Andrew's the same as well, I think. that Yeah. It's, yeah. it's, it's the history of – the history of – and, again, I'm going to take my academic head off here. The history of our <laughs> game belongs to the people who made the game. And I consider myself privileged that part of my work is to be able to do the research into the game that you know I was brought up with and has been part of my family – and part of my identity from ever since I can remember. So, um, you know, it's it's part of the it's part of the duty of the game. I think that we want to share it and strengthen it. Fully agree, one hundred percent. So yeah, everybody, check out uh, Rugby Reloaded. Uh, great podcast. You can check out very intense parts about rugby league history, rugby union history. Um, as Tony said, um, it's on all good podcasts. Uh, programs out there so get into that and uh thanks for dropping by tony thank you i've really enjoyed it we'll have to do this again sometime absolutely and we'll catch us all later